we acknowledge that the land the church is on today, here along Merriman Avenue, was a main thoroughfare of trade and travel for the people we know as the Cherokee. Not far from where the church sits, at the top of the hill between Merriman Avenue and Lexington, is an ancient Cherokee gravesite. We honor and give thanks for Cherokee elders, past, present, and future. Good evening. So welcome, special welcome to visitors here today, but welcome to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Uh, I think you probably had a chance to maybe see it outside there, but our mission statement at GCPC reminds us that our faith calls us to practice theological curiosity, moral courage, abundant compassion, beloved community. With God's help, we are seeking our transformation and the healing of the world. One of the ways in which we lean into this statement is our commitment to the process of dismantling white supremacy in our bodies, in our relationships, in our church, and in the greater community. So let's um, just take a couple moments to breathe that in. Oh, great spirit, we thank you that you instilled in us the curiosity to be here tonight to learn about the legacy and effects of urban renewal. We pray that we have the courage to truly listen and take the necessary actions. Please continue to grow in our hearts a compassion for each other, for that is how we will become the inclusive, beloved community that desire. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Um, I'm Liz Huseman, a member at uh, Grace Covenant. Welcome from PART, our power and race team, to our second in our summer racial series, the work of mutual liberation in the life of faith. Part started seven years ago when uh, Marsha started her uh, call at Grace Covenant um, Church. Um, thank you. Um, some of the language now that I'm going to use you're, is familiar if you listened to the sermon this morning. So we'll see if you listened. So. Um, with God's grace, part, we grapple with the ways we do things and challenge our white supremacy, both individually and systemic. We are an open, collaborative, generative, and transformative space. I was fortunate um, to hear uh, Ms. Robinson's presentation at the Reparations uh, Commission, because I go to most of the meetings. Um, and for part, I take uh, notes. So I run home and um, download my brain and um, send out notes to part. And on that evening that I heard her, I included a wonder, and that wonder was, what if we brought her to Grace Covenant? So I am thrilled to have her here tonight, and you will, it'll be a treat. She's wonderful. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce Elder Libby Kyles, who will fill this space with song. And if you didn't fill this out, um, sign up, please sign up. Good evening. 
evening. Good evening. How are you all? So here at Grace Covenant, we have been practicing bringing in worship with song. And the song that we've been singing for the past month is called Ella Song. <clears throat> Excuse me. And normally there are drums, but we don't have drums tonight. You just have me. You will get what you get and you won't pitch a fit. <laughs> and so if you know this song, I hope that you will join in. If you are a member at Grace Covenant, and I've seen you every Sunday all in June, I expect to see some movement and I expect to hear some voices. Amen. Uh, no, 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 no. Amen. All right, here we go. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Nice. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mother sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother son. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Not needing to clutch for power, not needing the light just to shine on me. I need to be just one in the number as we stand against tyranny. To me, young people come first. They have the courage where we fail. And if I can just shine the light on as they carry us through the gale, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I'm a woman and I speak with a voice and I must be heard. At times I can be quite difficult. I won't bow to no man's word. Cause we who believe in freedom, we cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it come. Come on now, we who believe in freedom, we cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. One more time. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you, Elder Kyle. <laughs> well, welcome again to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. I'm Marsha Mount Shoup. I'm the pastor head of staff here at Grace Covenant, and it is my honor tonight to introduce Reverend Tammy Forte Logan and Priscilla Robinson. I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about how we're going to do questions tonight. We're excited to have you here, whether you're in person or online, and we want you to feel like there's space for questions and conversation. And we also really want to curate our conversation in a way that's very supportive um, of, of Ms. Robinson's work and all of her expertise, and we want to give space for that to have the most space tonight. So if you have a question and you are joining us online, you can put that question in the YouTube chat, 
or you can email us at prayer at gcpcusa.org. That's prayer at gcpcusa.org. And that question will be received by GCPC staff and members of the Power and Race team. If you're here in person in the sanctuary, we have index cards, and we hope that you will fill one of those out. If you'd like for um, Amy Kim or me to bring you one now, you can raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. And we will take those up and we will, again, we will curate because there might be folks that have similar questions and um, there'll be time at the end for those questions to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Amy Kim. Yes, we do want you to feel free to get up and move and take care of yourself and whatever that means. This is a newly renovated sanctuary and it's made for you to get up and move around. So um, if you go out this door and turn right, there's a, a restroom for men right by the, the little coffee bar. If you turn left, there is a restroom for women. If you go up the steps, there is a multi-gender restroom too at the top of the steps. So please make yourself at home there. Also, if you're a GCPC member, just raise your hand. Any of these folks can help you if you're feeling lost. They'll, they're happy to, to support you. It is my honor to introduce once again a leader, a prophet, a visionary, a faithful follower in Jesus' way of justice and healing. Reverend Tammy Forte Logan is a beloved friend of Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church, and a dear colleague, friend, and soul sister of mine. She's a gift in my life, and in this community, and in the world. Reverend Forte Logan is the Equity Missioner of Faith for Justice Asheville, a collective dedicated to provoking justice for and with black and brown bodied people. For over 20 years, Tammy has advocated for and facilitated racial and economic justice in schools, nonprofits, foundations, government systems, and churches across Western North Carolina and throughout the state of North Carolina. Tammy's life work is the work of mutual liberation as the defining work of the church. Reverend Forte Logan has her Master of Divinity from Hood Seminary and is an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. She's a womanist, a preacher, a Christian educator, a popular, popular educator, a community organizer, and cultural organizer, and she currently serves Union Hill AME Zion Church. Tammy is here supporting us at Grace Covenant for the first four in our Summer Racial Justice Series. Tonight, she will be in conversation with our speaker, Ms. Robinson, and facilitate our questions and our answer portion of the evening. So once again, welcome Tammy Forte Logan. It is, all, it is also my great honor to welcome Priscilla Robinson tonight to Grace Covenant. Priscilla Robinson was born in Asheville. She's a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. She has nurtured and advocated for this community as her life's work. Her love for this community and her heart for being a person who cultivates the conditions for justice and healing, the justice and healing this community deserves help to fuel the work that she will share with us tonight. Ms. Robinson is a graduate of Shaw University with a Bachelor in Business Administration and Management. She also has a Master's Degree from Montreat College in Management and Leadership. Priscilla completed a research paper entitled The Impact of Urban Renewal. As after being asked, what is the pulse of your city? Why are the blacks so angry? She started her research 14 years ago in the University of North Carolina Asheville Special Collection Acquisition Files and worked with professors from UNC, Chapel Hill, Duke University, and University of Maryland Information Studies 
in case studies, studies referencing Asheville, particularly the South Side neighborhood. Ms. Robinson has published works that relate to this work and to her life in Asheville. She collaborated with the UNCA Diversity Center, Buncombe County Library, and North Carolina Humanities Council to publish Twilight of a Neighborhood. This publication received the Harlan Joel Graydon Award for Excellence. She is also the author of A Mother's Cry, He's Still My Child. Priscilla has also been involved in several other collaborative leadership projects here in Asheville, including Saving Walton Street Pool and Park, one of the few remaining historical sites for Asheville's black community. This site was recently designated as a local historical site through a collaborative effort with the Preservation Society and community members. She's also taken leadership in the Saving Livingston Street Elementary School, otherwise known as W.C. Reed Center. As chair of the Southside Community Advisory Board in collaboration with Housing Authority and community members, the school was saved from being demolished and renamed after the last principal of the school, the Arthur, Arthur Eddington Training and Development Center. Now, if all this wasn't enough, Priscilla Robinson has also done some other amazing things, just fueled with love and justice in her heart. She's a licensed therapeutic foster parent. She's a North Carolina guardian ad litem. She's a federal equal employment opportunity representative, a federal women program manager, a lead union steward for local 446 union, a military family support group leader, and a specialized trainer of military parents. Truly, Miss Robinson is an amazing human being. <laughs> <laughs> she has received honors that include the Unsung Hero Award, sponsored by Buncombe County Department of Health and Human Services, UNC Asheville, and Date My City. She was also a nominee for the Excellence in Public Service Award. You can learn more about her work at urbanrenewalimpact.org. And some of you have asked how you can financially support Ms. Robinson's work. Tonight, you can make a donation to Grace Covenant, either online or with a check within the memo line. Just put Priscilla Robinson or the Urban Renewal Impact, and that gift will be passed through directly to Ms. Robinson. Ms. Robinson, it is an honor to have you here with us tonight. Thank you for the energy, the courage, the commitment you pour into this community and into sharing truth and vision for healing, for justice and repair. Welcome to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I need my eyes. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And if you don't mind, I want to take the time to do specific thanks. I first want to thank God for the ability to stand before you this evening. I want to thank Grace Covenant for the opportunity to be here. And I thank all of you have who have taken the interest to physically be here and to be here via live stream. I wish to thank Asheville, Southside community especially, family and friends who have been supportive and who have shared their stories during my research of over 14 years. I thank Dr. Massinio and Dr. Lee who have collaborated with me They've collected data and they've made Asheville Urban Renewal Impact a case study. Through uh, them, I also want to thank UNCA Asheville, Professors Dr. Mullins, Dr. Bessalel, who held his classes at the YMI Cultural Center, where his students assisted in collecting community members' stories. 
I want to thank Deborah Miles, UNCA Diversity Center. I want to thank UNCA Chapel Hill, Duke University, Dr. Kathy Davison, who created an independent study class, who made trips to Asheville. I also would like to thank, thank University of Maryland and the North Carolina Humanities Council, Emeritus Harlan Graydon for the publication of Crossroad, Twilight of a Neighborhood, and all who were on the team to include Andrea Clark, Dwayne Barton, and Karen Loftmiller, Buncombe County Librarian. Thank you to the members of Asheville City Council and Buncombe County Commission for being a listening ear. Thank you to the Preservation Society of Asheville, Buncombe County, making Walton Street Park Pool a local historic site. Thank you for all of the media that has covered the urban renewal impact discussions. And last but not least, I would like to thank Portia Fabian Evans. She's a lifetime friend and classmate who assisted me in building the website. And I'm looking out in the audience, and I can't, uh, cannot forget to thank my church members who prayed for me at St. James AME. And I want to acknowledge other f um, friends who are in the audience who have come out to support um, also the assistant uh, mayor, the vice mayor of Asheville City, and my friend Dee who has worked with me throughout this whole process of urban renewal research. And I see Miss Phyllis over there too. So glad to see y'all. Thank you for coming out and supporting. The information presented uh, throughout the website surrounds the urban renewal implementation. Most of the contents um, connects the human side, the faces, the lives who experience the urban renewal impact to the homes, the businesses were, that were taken. The re remapping tab on the website displays specific property information and amounts uh, that homes were purchased for, not only the homes but business owners. The urban renewal implementation it resulted in life and economic changes, community disruptions. It was a devastating community root shock. The implementation uprooted communities, families, businesses, and homeowners. It literally uprooted trees, gardens, dreams, trust, and hopes, the comfort and peace within all which were part of a thriving community. No one went hungry, no one was homeless, and no one felt unfavored, unwelcomed, and or out of place. There were four thriving and close-knit black communities, Stumptown, East End, Hill Street, and Southside. I lived in the Southside during a time when community meant unity. Everyone knew each other, and we lived out. It takes the village. The children played safely in the streets. Young men and women were taught trades by the black business owners. There was much respect for one another. And the children were taught values and morals at an early age. For those four thriving, close-knit black communities, it was home until the change began. The Redevelopment Commission begun the East Riverside Redevelopment Program in 1968. The 407-acre project was a combination of rehabilitation and redevelopment. This project was the largest project in the Southeast. Substandard housing in the South Side, also known east as East Riverside, part of the area now known as the River Arts District, and another part of South Side area is evolving into the South Slope. Those houses were replaced by the Housing Authority City of Asheville. These units are known as public housing. From 1970 through 2000, 
Asheville drastically changed and continues to change. The city of Asheville and Housing Authority took lead in attempting to improve living conditions in the black community through urban renewal implementation. Homes, businesses, people were uprooted. Families were scattered all across the cities. Some were able to purchase homes and relocated to unwelcome areas, but most residents were relocated to public housing with the high rise designated specifically for the elderly. It still stands on Southridge Broad and there are still residents. Other community members relocated to other cities and states. Now, when I hear people talk about public housing residents and how they've lived there for over 50 years, it really makes me, and I don't like to use the word angry, but it, it ruffles my feathers. Because what most people don't realize is many of those people in public housing are there because their families' homes were taken their grandchildren, their children, that were pretty much herded in to public housing. They didn't have a choice. Now that I've said that. Sadly, along <laughs> with some deteriorating structures in the name of progress, the black citizen of Asheville lost beloved neighborhoods, schools, such as Livingston Street School, such as um, Stevens Lee and other schools, black owned businesses and a strong sense of community. Where homes once stood, there are now credit unions, doctor's offices, fire stations, and walking trails. As, I'm sorry. And city buildings, you're correct. Thank you, Ms. Cowles. As many black community members visit Southside, they question what happened to the dollar lots that were not sold back to families as promised and as Dr. Wesley Grant advocated for. How many remain? How many were sold and to whom? Thanks to research, the data tab on the website provides some of those answers. Let me go more personal and share with you comments from the community members pertaining to the implementation of urban renewal. Quote, urban renewal implementation authorities told people it was going to be better living. Most houses were dilapidated. Beach Hill had nice homes. Many of the homes were not dilapidated or blighted. Miss Virginia Holloway, who was promised the dollar lot and who grieved herself to death because it never happened. There was a man who would not sell his property. His water and lights were cut off. Once he left his house, the house was burned down to the ground. The homeowner was sent an apology letter from the city. And I came across that letter doing my research in the records at UNCA Special Collection. The Southside community was a village. It was a family. The whole community took care of the children. We used to sleep with doors opened. Can't do that now. The system has a lot to do with it all. When we re relocated, we were happy at first. After a while, it seemed like a concentration camp living in public housing. Streets were blocked off. Living at 477 South Ranch Broad, was much nicer than living in public housing." Unquote. And this is from my mother and my aunts. Another quote, urban renewal took people's property for little to nothing. What could we do about it? Many people had no means to fight for their property. It wouldn't have mattered anyhow because the city does what they want to do. Gentrification wiped out our neighborhoods and is still in effect." Unquote. Let's travel through my eyes as a nine-year-old child, which is pictured up on the screen. 
be like Stevie Wonder. Isn't she lovely? <laughs> Livingston Street School, currently known as the Arthur Edison Center. I remember going to Livingston Street School, going into the library. Mrs. Owens would invite me in. And she would teach me how to read, and she would give me all kind of books to read. I never got to attend Livingston Street School because integration occurred, and I ended up going to Vance Elementary. New Bethel Missionary Baptist Church is where I started. That's where I was baptized, and it's still in operation. Miss Littlejohn's house. Miss Littlejohn was a little old wi uh, widow but she made the best cupcakes. You could smell the cupcakes all the way down the street. And I made it my business to make my way to her house every day. <laughs> Miss Louise Moore. Miss Louise Moore was my babysitter. And I couldn't wait to get to her house. Miss Louise Moore made the best string beans and potatoes. The Fosters, the Smiths, the Haddons, the Robinsons, who are still in the community, we were the biggest families. And we often got in the street and we played softball and we played kickball and we made uh, skating boards where we took the wheels off the old skates and made our little string and we rolled down the hill. Mm -hmm. What a fun time we had. Harlem's Grocery Store. Family members still live, granddaughter, Jackie Howe. Her grandparents' grocery store was taken. And when I asked Jacqueline, do you know what happened? She had no idea. So I was able to show her pictures and provide information. Haynes Grocery Store, which was located on Pfeiffer, a lot is still empty. Mr. Haynes was able to relocate his grocery store out in the shallow area. Ellen Funeral Home. Let me tell you a story about Ellen Funeral Home. <laughs> My brother and I, who's also shown on the website, we watched the adults as they went, and often we went with my grandfather to view the bodies. So one day we decided to go to Ellen's Funeral Home to view the bodies on our own. We knocked on the door. Mr. Ellen came standing at the door with his shoulders like lurch. <laughs> and he says, yes, may I help you? And we said, yes, we come to view the bodies, please. <laughs> Mr. Allen said, it's nobody's body here but mine. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you can imagine our little legs ran as fast as we could back home. The O'Hannons, the O'Hannon family owned over eight homes. Family members still live here. William and Della Stoner, they owned over eight homes, enough homes to give each daughter a home. Walton Street Pool and Park, it's where many of us went. As a matter of fact, all of the black Asheville community, it was the only pool and park we could go to. There was a hill at the top of the park, which was swings. We'd go swing, and we often had fairs to come to town. Picnics were held there. It's where I received my first job. It's where I started to receive my lifeguard certificate and many others. And I'm thankful once again for the uh, Preservation Society who has helped us uh, mark the park as a historical, a local historical site. And we're working on uh, making it a national historical site. Mm -hmm. So all of the people impacted, homeowners, business owners, those who rent it. And we feel that the impact also played a part of increased homelessness. Because once people went into public housing, if family members were not listed on the lease, they could not live there. If family members had gone to jail or prison, 
they could not live there. And so even today, you know, as I drive around, I see so many local friends who are homeless. Houses are gone. And, and it's, it's really sad. Generational wealth, home ownership, jobs was impacted. But out of it, the certificate of occupancy came. The city made it to where if the home or the house was not livable, it was condemned and people could not rent. So I'm thankful for that. However, the greatest impact is many community members lost trust, hope. Many community members have festering wounds that have never healed. Many home owners grieve themselves to death over promises of dollar lots, as I previously mentioned, uh, Mrs. Virginia Holloway. Redlining, which identified the different areas through zip codes on the map, made it hard, and it drastically decreased financing for homes to be rebuilt. The elderly and widows of homes that were completely paid off and who lived on fixed income, couldn't afford to rebuild. And the little money given for the homes surely wasn't enough to rebuild. Many community members expressed they were not informed, they were deceived, and property was stolen in the name of urban renewal implementation. And today, today as many watch the reparation process, many feel that it's just a show, that Asheville City is going through the motion, but as always, we'll do what they want to do. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Vice Mayor. Today, many questions the fact that Asheville City Attorney, why is he so involved with the commission? Why is he the one that they have to refer to for consultation and advice? Justice reparation money is used to pay consultants. Why can't funds be used to hire an attorney? not affiliated with the city, but for the di diverse committees. This is an opportunity for the city of Asheville to make amends that makes a difference. The community thank the authoritative figures within the city and county for the deeds that they have already done. But we are looking for a better shift of making it right. The community still have concerns and believes the beginning of reparation is building relationships, true and honest relationships, through trust. Can we trust you to listen to all voices? Will you not be deceptive and make decisions that pushes black Asheville out of the equation and off the playing field? Inclusiveness. Invite more community members to the table, especially when it comes to plans of action that impacts Black Asheville. Not just yes people. Awareness. Please do better in your community outreach. Realize, we realize, and others need to realize, that policy and practice are two different entities. Decision-making power from local to federal government consists of individuals, some who don't have everyone's best interests in mind, some who pushes unspoken racial privilege. Learning and focusing on repairing injustice and shifting bias practices and all of the above it's the beginning and a strong foundation for reparation. Other community 
observation and concerns referencing the reparation commission meetings and news are being, they have been forwarded and expressed via my website. And I would like to share those as well. The first one, and I received this via email, there's a problem with the commission calling in the city attorney to review the potential proposals and to weigh in on wording. If you go back to the resolution establishing the commission, it states in item number eight at the end of the document listing, listing the resolutions. Quote, the task of the commission is to issue a report in a timely manner for consideration by the city and other participating community groups for incorporation into their respective short and long-term priorities and plans. The person writing this email says, I point to this language to say that if the city is the only entity able to shape the recommendations before they are even voted upon by the commission, then the other participating community groups are at a disadvantage. Even Buncombe County does not have the access that the city has given, that the city attorney has effectively been given a seat on the commission. If he is consulted to say yay or nay to wording or the direction of proposals, the commission is designed to act independently of the city in the sense that the scope of the recommendations it can make are truly broad. The resolution goes on to state that the report and resulting budgetary and programmatic, programmatic pri priorities may include but not to be limited to increasing minority home ownership and access to others. Affordable housing, increasing minority businesses, ownership and career opportunities, strategies to grow equity and generational wealth, closing the gaps in health care, education, employment, and pay, neighborhood safety and fairness within criminal justice. When you consider the scope of the recommendation the commission can make, it makes sense to exclude rather than include the city attorney whose role and job description is to protect the city and not to support bold proposals that push the city to explore its budget and opportunities in ways it has failed to and refused to do in the past. All participating groups should have equal access to the commission's deliberative process, not just the city. Again, that was emailed to me from an individual who is watching from outside of the Asheville city. Number two, why can't the reparation committee have their own civil rights attorney? Using the reparation funds the city uses. Attorney James Ferguson, a native of Asheville, spoke at a previous community meeting. After an individual stood and stated, if the city went forward with reparation, they would sue. Attorney Ferguson stated, it is not illegal for a group to seek reparation. It's all about documentation and wording. Someone else sent a news report as reported on the Rutherford.North Carolina GOP. Since Asheville City has already settled a discrimination suit filed by Western North Carolina Citizen for Equality, how will that impact the work and recommendations of the Reparation Commission? They submitted an article that was published from Judicial Watch, January 16th, 2022. I don't know if anyone else had seen that, if, if it was even uh, published here in the Asheville area. But, and I won't read the whole thing, um, it's available on the website for, for you to read, but the city of Asheville, North Carolina, settled our federal civil rights 
lawsuit after agreeing to remove all racially discriminatory provisions in a city-funded scholarship program. The city also agreed to remove racially discriminatory eligibility provisions in a related program that provides grants to educators. The city council approved the settlement on January 11th. In October 2021, we filed the lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of North Carolina on behalf of a North Carolina citizen group, Western North Carolina Citizens for Equality, whose members included high school students who were ineligible for a scholarship program only because they are not black. And it goes on to describe the background. In July 2020, Asheville City Council unanimously approved what is called a reparation initiative that provided funding to a program geared toward increasing home ownership and business and career opportunities for black residents. So the question again is, how will this settlement of a suit impact what's going on with the Reparation Commission? Now what I want to do now is share with you some of the data that was discovered in the research, because I think that's very important also. Um, we're going to share it for as long as we can. I think I have 45 minutes, and if we begin to run over the 45 minutes, we'll cut it off. But that uh, video is on the website. Please feel free to go to the website, Urban Renewal Impact, and access it along with other data that's there. Uh, the website includes pictures. It includes brief stories. If you just uh, tap on the picture, it'll open up and give you information. Um, everything is there as far as the community. It also includes um, the publication, Twilight of a Neighborhood, which is inclusive of all the four African-American communities. So at this point in time, we can go ahead and start um, the video. Sit back, relax, open your minds, and enjoy.
whole cover over and gives information on the pictures. Okay, can we move on to the uh, data tab? The data tab includes remapping and economics. Remapping is uh, a dream that I had. I wanted to remap the community and connect the families and the faces so we wouldn't just be looking at parcels. Uh, we have two different categories. We have the remapping and then we have the economic side. And we'll hear more about that. Uh, would you please move on to the collaborators? The collaborators is the team, and there you'll find the different credentials. Okay, we can move on to the reparations. We're moving pretty fast here. The reparation tab is just different, um, I guess, publications. And if you click on them, it'll open those up. And it's public, uh, publication information for both local and national. Okay, we move on to the blog. The blog is most current events and reports. So you can click on those and it'll open up that information. Okay, we move, move on to the second gallery. The second gallery is inclusive of the whole Asheville community. Uh, Professor Esselel, he's retired from UNCA. He, um, had his class to come to the YMI Culture Center where we collected stories from some of the elders. Okay, and let's move on to the contact. The contact tab uh, allows individuals to present questions, comments, upload pictures, and history. And if you would like after this presentation, you can also contact Dr. Messini or Dr. Lee directly. your presentation, Dr. Lee, who will focus on the data tab remap. Alright, so uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, I want to introduce our map uh, briefly. Uh, in this map, we collaboratively built this map, and there are four important functions in this map. The number one is searchability. You can search based on person name or street name uh, to search for any parcels that were uh, acquired by the housing authority in the 60s and 70s. So for example, if I uh, write down Robinson here, uh, you can see all the parcels that has Robinson name here, not only the owners, but also the tenants here. Uh, the second important function is uh, the, the ability to see the past and the present. So if you see on the left, you, you see there are four different checkboxes. Uh, if I turn on everything, uh, you can see the yellow and pink layer, which is coming from the uh, Asheville website. This is a uh, city-owned properties currently. And then if I uh, remove the checkbox, you can see the blue dots, which are uh, 1963 city directory, which is basically all the small businesses that were present, present in the past, in the 60s. Remove that, uh, you see there are clickable parcels. These are basically all the parcels that are acquired during the 60s and 70s. Removing that, uh, you can see the urban renewal map uh, during the 60s that was used as part of the planning. And then if I remove that, you see the current on my maps here. So by clicking on and off uh, for these different layers, you can see the past and present at the same time. The third important function is the ability to see the acquisition processes entirely. So if you look at the bottom of the website, there's a year. For now, it's 1964. And if I increase the years, you can see the color coding change, which means that uh, it shows basically uh, the process of acquisition processes. And then if you see on the right, uh, you know, at the same time, in that year, uh, you, can, you can see the number of, number of parcels that are appraised or uh, decided or whether, you know, how many parcels were, uh, were done with the transfer of deed, right? So it, you can see all these kind of analytics by moving the year bar in the at the bottom.
And then finally, uh, at, the, at the parcel level, you can see all the necessary information about operator processes. You know, when operator was done, and when offer was made, when decision was made, and then when the transfer of deed happened, right? And then also you can see the operator's names and owners, uh, tenants' names, and also you know uh, other information such as the photo, photos of the old scenes. And these are all coming from the UNCA uh, special collection documents. So this is a brief introduction of the map we have built. Uh, and based on that, I think uh, Ms. Robinson will provide some uh, uh, walkthrough of the maps. Okay, so what I want to do now is to bring it right in this room. We have many um, Reparation Commission members who were, the families were impacted by the implementation of urban renewal. And so, Dr. Lee, would you bring up Hain? Say the name one more time. Haynes, H A Y N E S. Mr. Haynes was the owner of a grocery store that sat on the corner of Blanton Street, right across from Brown's Temple. He was able to relocate his business to the sh uh, shallow community. If I'm not loud enough, please let me know. You're able to see this? Yes, Dr. Basidio. Okay, wonderful. So um, it's my honor and privilege to participate tonight. Um, and um, our goal is to share some of the data findings uh, with the commission. In addition to Priscilla and Nyong, I would quickly like to acknowledge a number of collaborators who took part in a second study. Um, Ray McCoy, Mark Conrad, Rosie Grant, Alexis Hill, Philip Nicholas, 
Noah Shear and Alan Weirdak, located from Minnesota, West Virginia, California to Maryland. So these are some of the research questions um, we asked with input from uh, some, some of the community members. Questions uh, about who, how much, which, and when. So I'm gonna go over these seven questions, but mostly uh, in the interest of time, focus on the third one, uh, which is something uh, that's been mentioned in, in previous meetings that seems to be uh, of importance, which properties does the city still own? Um, there's much greater detail, we'll come back to that in an executive report with lots of graphics and all the data and analyses and visualizations and also in a companion paper that goes with this. Um, some acknowledgements first. All of our data analyses use uh, content and data from Asheville. The uh, land acquisition files at UNC Asheville and, and the rest of the data is from the county. It's Buncombe County GIS, both parcel ownership and property cards, and Buncombe County Register of Deeds information. So before I get started, uh, a, a challenge I have to mention, the biggest challenge uh, has been connecting the pre and post urban renewal data. So I'm gonna pick just one property quickly to, to illustrate why this is a huge challenge. If you look on the right at 10 Gilliam Place, that's between South French Broad and Blanton, just north of Pfeiffer. That's that blue kind of shoe-like uh, parcel. Um, that's the current uh, property. If you go back on the left, that, that, the study we did was, was in June 2022, last summer. If you go back to the left, you'll see June 1965. So, uh, what you should notice here is that in 1965 there were eight properties that overlapped with 10 Gillian Place. I, I list the owners there in some pictures. Uh, four located on South Grove Street and four located on Blanton Street. And of course, neither uh, do South Grove Street nor Dewitt Street exist anymore. So, so that's one of the challenges of relating uh, the present from things that are now obscured very often or even invisible. How did we solve that? Well, our solution was to calculate, this, is, this, this slide is a little more technical, but it's kind of behind the scenes, to calculate percentages of parcel overlap. So the goal was to understand how current parcels were assembled. And what we essentially did was a reverse engineering to map back to the past. And so if you look at the, the graph on the, the picture on the left, what we're essentially saying is that Ben Gillian Place was constructed with portions of those eight parcels. And we characterize the, the portions, 35% of 1517, and down on the right-hand side, 2% of 1617. Doing that, that kind of calculation, and that's automated, or for modern par current parcels in Asheville, allows us to tell kind of the origin story of all the current parcels and connect the past to the present. That's really been what's been missing. And now that we've been able to solve that, we can ask all kinds of research questions, such as the preliminary questions we're sharing with you tonight. So really quickly, the, the, what you learn by, by doing this kind of mapping is that 10 billion place was repackaged over a six year period from 68 to 75, um, using eight acquisition parcels at a uh, calculated purchase cost of $23,000. It was resold three years later in 78 for $5,400. And in the afterlife, in, in June 2022, that one property is valued by the county. So it's all, count, all county city data. Uh, close to $350,000. So this is what we did. We essentially uh, did this kind of mapping intersection percentage overlap, not just for the yellow property there, but for all 224 current parcels, connecting them to the 930 acquisition parcels in our database. So let's, uh, let's tackle the questions now. Who was affected by urban renewal? Well, you saw that in Young's presentation. From our database, we can draw a list 
of all the former owners and renters. So this potentially speaks to the question of who was affected or who was harmed. We can identify individuals and families. B, how much did the city of Asheville pay for urban renewal properties? So we have lots of graphics, but here's an executive summary. The total acquisition parcel was a little over $6 million across all 930 acquisition parcels. The median acquisition parcel value was just a little over $5,000, meaning that half of the owners were offered more than 5,000, half were offered less. But the important number is that 85% of all the acquisitions were below 10K. So it really shows you kind of the range uh, where properties were purchased. Um, C, which properties does the city still own? So in, in, to answer this question, we went back to one additional city uh, data set. This was something published June 3rd, 2021 by the city of Asheville. And they released a story map website showing all the city owned properties that came from urban renewal. If we go to that website on the left, you see that there are 13 properties based according to the city on the south side that are still owned by the city. So we took the, those are the orange and then one fuchsia uh, parcel on the left. So we took those 13 parcels, dropped them on our map, and we also used the 1963 Asheville uh, Historical City Directory or phone book. So what I'm going to show you uh, in the next minute or two, we're going to zoom into one of those 13 parcels, parcel number four on the right, the one that's uh, fuchsia colored. So that's zooming into parcel, city parcel number four, also known as Future Nasty Branch Greenway. As of June 2022, it appeared to be vacant. That's located along the Town Branch Greenway, bounded by South French Broad Avenue and Congress Street and Gaston Street, west and east, and Choctaw Street, Livington, Livington Street, north and south. As you know, it's, it's just north of the former Livington Street School. If we take this parcel, this single city owned parcel, and show the impact of urban renewal on that parcel, um, we had a much clearer um, idea of what happened. If you look at the impact on businesses, there are at least, we know there are more, but there are at least 23 business, at least 23 businesses were erased. Yeah. These include grocery stores, churches, restaurants, beauty parlors, barber shops, etc. If you look at the impact of city parcel number four on the loss of homes, from our database, we identified 34 acquisition parcels. We show the pictures of the homes, and there's some absolutely beautiful homes here. Uh, it's uh, pristine properties. So, so what can we conclude from that? Well, when we try to measure the impact of city-owned properties, uh, if you do that kind of overlap, not just for number four, but for all 13 of those city-owned parcels, you come up with 169 acquisition parcels that were affected. This represents 18% of the original pool of the 930 acquisition parcels. So it's really significant, and it puts things in a different perspective. If we go one step further and we look at uh, Housing Authority of City of Asheville, Haga owned properties, there's seven of them. Of course, you recognize Erskine, Livingston Heights, Walton, Livingston Street, etc. If you take those seven parcels, they intersect or overlap with 147 formerly acquisition or acquisition parcels. That's an additional 16% of the original pool of 930 acquisition parcels. So if you combine those two effects of Haga owned and city-owned properties, there's a 34% combined in urban renewal impact. This is just for 20 modern or current parcels. So those parcels were repackaged during urban renewal into these very, very large chunks, but they overlap with 316 properties. This represents over a third of the original pool of 930 acquisition parcels. So the group believes that this is really an indication of the depth of the legacy of Stop urban the recording, in please. It's not a few parcels, it's a few <laughs> modern parcels. 
out of respect for your time and the lot of time I was given, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. You're welcome to find that same recording, that uh, presentation on the website, along with the executive paper that was done. I do want to add, um, in looking at the uh, price, the amount that were given for some of the property, the lowest I seen was $10. $10. Um, and I also, before I take my seat and end my presentation, I would like to acknowledge you, John. I see you sitting there. Uh, he was instrumental in redesigning the uh, Arthur Editing Center. So, good to see you here. I thank you all for your attention. I thank you again for the opportunity to present um, part of my research paper. And I hope that you'll walk away with something that will inspire you to join the movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The other thing I want to say before you leave, please feel free to check out the map. All of those, this is south side, the whole south side, and everything in red is the property that was taken. While we're waiting for, while we're waiting for the questions to come, I do have one, but I, I just want to, to name. I know as you were doing your presentation, you paused when you talked about feeling anger, mm -hmm. and I just want to invite you to feel what you feel, mm -hmm. um, because you have every right. Black Ashevillians have every right to feel anger. Anger is an emotion, just like other emotions that God gave us, mm -hmm. right? right? And I know we have the stereotype of the angry black woman, that's okay. <laughs> we can be angry when we need to. That should make people angry, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to name that. And um, it was just incredible. I was at that, that meeting, at the Reparations Commission meeting when you presented it, and I remember as, as you were playing it uh, tonight that they tried to shorten your time yes. in doing your presentation, and you stood up for yourself. <laughs> you advocated to make sure this information came forward, yes. so I acknowledge that Thank you. as well. And I know that um, you know, often when we think about urban renewal, we think about properties, people think about bricks and mortars. Mm -hmm. But what you brought to light was the human impact, mm -hmm. the lives, the stories. Like, I could smell those cupcakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I could taste the green beans and potatoes, <laughs> right? And I think we've got to figure out how to connect to people's humanity. Yes. Um, when we're talking about justice mm -hmm. issues, um, and so I really appreciate the way that you have put this together. It's incredible. And it's even better now than it was when I first saw it. Yeah, thank absolutely, you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I really appreciate that. And I'm just, I just, I just want people of faith to really let this sink in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they stole folks' property. They're still trying to steal folks' property. And as you were talking about, um, I think you were just receiving information from folks on your website, and you were, several times it came up about the city attorney. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying that, I thought about Audre Lorde's quote, that the master's house cannot be dismantled by the master's tools. Mm -hmm. And the attorney is a tool for the city. Yes. So I wonder, and maybe this is not the question for you, but maybe it's a question for some of us who um, are advocating in different ways for, for justice. Uh, what is it that needs to be done to get legal representation for the interest of the commission and not the city? Has anybody talked about that with you? Mm, no, okay. not at this point. And I don't want to put the vice mayor on um, 
but I would love to hear it if you're willing. Okay. What 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 will it take? Let me get the mic to you. I'll answer it the best I can. Okay. Okay. When the reparations committee was put together, mm -hmm. basically uh, they were a committee that were sort of set up to sort of give us an idea of directions and things that they needed. And when I heard Priscilla mention that, that is a very, <laughs> very compelling, you know, point that we definitely, you definitely need uh, their own attorney. So basically, we just like we've uh, stopped the harm that you've actually have given counsel uh, as the first task, mm -hmm. and we're working on that. And I think we should have uh, that report for the end of the month or something. Yeah. Okay. And basically, with the same thing that she just said about for them needing their own attorney, that could also be a request to counsel that you can put forward, and I'm quite sure that we do, we will, you know, understand that and, prob and can accommodate that. Yeah. And like I said, like I said, like I said, <laughs> this is the best. This is my opinion, and and I am answering that. That's uh, as best I can. And basically, what I will say is because pretty much, I mean, I, people on the council are all for reparations and all for what we're doing here. And we're trying to do all we can to make sure that it is a success. So I'm, that's the reason I said I'm quite sure that I'm, we would be able to look at something to make that work. Thank you. Um, so. We're going to make sure that's followed through upon. Um, when I say we, we community, that's faith leaders, right? Faith for Justice and GCPC. Uh, we need to ask those questions um, because it's really, really important. Because there's a particular lens that the city attorney is always going to look through, and we understand that. He's doing his job, yeah. but we need someone to do the job on behalf of Black Astro. So uh, thank you for, for reading those points. Um, again, the question that came from, from YouTube was around whether this was presented, and it was presented at the Reparations Commission, that's where I saw it, and um, the, the follow-up question is how did the commission members respond? So I know they kind of shortened your time and they kind of rushed you out and they went on to business as usual, but... <laughs> I'm sure there were after conversations. I'm sure there's been some type of outreach from the Reparations Commission, and I would, I would love to hear that, if you don't mind I that. actually honestly don't know. I mean, after the presentation, I had a lot of the commission members come to me mm -hmm. and um, thanked me for the information, mm -hmm. told me that it was the best presentation that they had received uh -huh. as far Absolutely. as providing data. Absolutely. Um, Dee, I don't want to put you on the spot. Would you like to respond because Dee is on the commission. Are you in the housing IFA? Yes, yes I thought that's where I've seen you. So I would, I would love to hear from, from her as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm just curious, how, how did you all respond? to that and I don't want you to share any strategy but just how did it land with thank you how did that presentation land with the housing IFA and did you find it useful in you developing um, recommendations for thank the you. city and county department? well like Priscilla said earlier I've been working with her for a long time we were both we were both raised in the South Side community mm -hmm. and uh, I have really strong feelings about what's going on. Once Priscilla did her presentation, it touched a lot of hearts in there, especially the ones that knew the history mm -hmm. of urban renewal, because a lot of us lived through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we requested that she comes back to several other, other meetings. Uh, I talked to Priscilla and I shared with her how I felt. And uh, a lot of others. They felt that her information was very important mm -hmm. and that we could use this information to go forward. Absolutely. So I, I think she did a wonderful job and I know she's been working on it for a long time and it's, it's really helped me to give my input in some of the 
meetings we have, especially in housing. Absolutely. Yeah, so it was it's a great mix of, go ahead, um, of both the human reality of urban renewal, renewal which I also hear called urban removal. removal. That's, That's a term right. I often hear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the empirical data, like you can't question that. Mm -hmm. It was so detailed. And so I hope that you're thinking about some dollar figures to go with those percentages that were presented. Reparations is not just dollars. I do understand that. I do know cessation of harm is the first thing. And I know that our vice mayor has named that there's some things in, in motion, right, to address current harm, but we still know harm is still happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the data is just indisputable, and I understand you can skew data in different ways. That, that's the most comprehensive presentation I've seen um, of data being provided, so I really appreciate that. Uh, this is certainly her, her life's work, her heart's work, her ministry, and it shows, um, and more people need to see this. Yes, ma'am. They can't hear you. I just want to say, well, I'm very, I'm very proud of my friend and my dear sister, um, and the information is just way beyond phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first meeting her and I went to mm -hmm. that we didn't know anything that was going on by rep reparation. I was just invited to do the prayer. Mm -hmm. um, my question, once again, where do you see the direction of the committee? A reparation going to help those that have lost what they have lost and the things that are still going on in Asheville as well as Black Mountain where I live mm -hmm. that people are not only losing properties um, there's nothing being input back into these towns and cities um, as far as reparation in California they have begun to pay uh, people of generational losses. And that's where I want to know where they're going because the answers that we got at the church um, was very vague. And then Priscilla had been working on this for the longest. And she took the initiative to uh, go and be at that committee meeting. Mm -hmm. And we was praying all the time when they went to shut her down. But God, the <laughs> Holy Ghost had her to speak. Yeah, so. Amen. So I want you to answer that one, and then we've got two other questions. Okay, can I answer that? Yes. Okay. First of all, I would like to say that I am very proud of those who have taken the time to serve on the commission. We have a lot of young people. Um, and I think as long as that commission is empowered by the community coming and being supportive, coming and making the comments, giving the input, and as long as uh, we can take some of the stronghold that they have over them, if they can be allowed to do what they've been tasked to do, then I think that commission will make a big difference as far as the community. Same story, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so people need to show up and they need to speak up who were black Ashevillians, yes. right? Who were being impacted directly by this. Because um, I didn't know there was a time where community can chime in. It's not much time. Oh, yes. But, but you can still speak up. So speak up. I encourage anybody who's watching this, who's listening, to show up at those reparation commission meetings and speak up. Because they can't do it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. They have to feel supported by their community. Okay, Ms. Cowles. You know, I got something. I'm coming, Elder Cowles. <laughs> I'm coming, Elder Cowles. I think you're right that people need to show up, but those meetings also need to be held in places that are accessible to Black Asheville. So there's a history with Asheville, not just Asheville, it's everywhere, mm -hmm. where we want people to give input, but we want them to come to us mm -hmm. and give the input. So what might need to happen is we take these meetings to neighborhoods where people can give their input, where people don't feel like, oh my gosh, I gotta get up, I just got off work, I gotta get childcare, I gotta do all these different things. So 
if we want community to be responsive and we want community to give input, we also need to give community access. Mm -hmm. Because I have it. Do we have it? Okay. So yeah, a attending your presentation um, when I went, I had to find parking down the street. I had mm -hmm. to walk up a hill. It was nighttime. It was a little scary, mm -hmm. right? And then find my way there. So accessibility is really important. So thank you for naming that, uh, Sister Libby do you, Cows. Do you want to read the questions that you have, and I then do. I see Phyllis and okay. Dee again. Okay, so one question is, what do you mean by serious change? And then um, the response is, they're still stealing our property that is doubling the original injustice. So how do you, what does serious change look like to you? I'm just gonna be straight up and honest. We need that. Serious change to me means to be true and honest about the white privilege that's happening. Uh, some people in attending uh, building bridges mm -hmm. have acknowledged that there is white privilege. Mm -hmm. Some people still haven't, but for the ones who acknowledge, we need for you all to stand up with us and speak up to bring the change that is needed within the community. I mean, it is what it is. It's happening. It may not be happening to you, mm -hmm. but it's happening to us. We're walking in those shoes, and just like winning the right to vote, the women came together, black and white. Mm -hmm. The men joined in, and we won the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And so, such as that, we got to come together as a community. Red, yellow, black, and white, it doesn't matter. We're the underdog, and when I say we, I mean the people of color, the black people. We need support. We need help. Mm -hmm. So for serious change, serious you change. need help. We need you help. You need people from all, all. across Asheville, from yes. every stripe, yes. to show up yes. in support. Yes. Okay. All right. Got you. Everybody heard that? Yeah. I know GCPC is going to show up. I'm counting <laughs> on that. Okay, here is another one. What is your opinion of the current viability of the housing development? Let's start with that. <sighs> That's a loaded one. That is a loaded one. And I'm going to be honest with that. Now, I, you know, I got to say that the city is doing their part in trying to uh, build affordable housing for the working class and low income for the ones that or on fixed income. I do know that there's accountability that's got to be done, and there's also responsibility. I do know, and I'm gonna reference, um, I say the old Lee Walker height. Many of us complain about how Lee Walker height was taken, but it was rebuilt with new development. Now we look at what's going on, and the, the truth is, and honesty is, we have our own people, people of color, black people, who are up causing all kind of havoc, as my grandmother would say. You have the shooting going on. People are afraid to live there. They're moving out. Mm -hmm. we, got, we got to hold people accountable. I don't care what color they are. Mm -hmm. It's about account accountability. It, it, it's about not uh, coming up with excuses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because truth be told, our young people, are out of control. And that's where we all need to come together once again and try to bring about change because people, families want to be safe wherever they're living. Mm -hmm. That's the new complex. All of that that's going up there shouldn't be happening. Yeah, and so that makes me question because you know there are other new complexes mm -hmm. across Asheville where it's not happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's different? And, it, and it, for me, it's not just about who the residents are, but it's who owns the property. It's, it's who manages the property. Because there's certain things you can't do in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right? That's right. There's certain things people who reside there are not going to deal with. 
right? And, and if the police are called, they're coming quickly. Exactly. But that's because people will show up and people will make phone calls and people will do the things they need to do, right? So I don't, I, what I, I want to be careful of is blaming the residents. Exactly. Because they were set up, just like that was set up, mm -hmm. right? Right. They told people, we're going to give you a better life. You're going to come in public housing. And they were in a box. And you cram people in a box. And then you lock them in the box. You're going to have crime. You're going to have a lot of unrest, a lot of conflict. It's just our human nature. You can't cram people in a corner, right? Well, and and I, I heard the first part, and um, black mamas, black daddies who have mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. when they are not doing what they need to do, they do need to be held responsible. Mm -hmm. So it's a both end for sure. Right. So I just, I want to just make sure we see both sides of exactly. that. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of conversations in some black churches about the recent violence that's mm -hmm. happened, um, which is the ongoing violence mm -hmm. that has happened in the city of Asheville. But root causes is important. Root causes. Right. Like we gotta get to the root and stop just just blaming those those kids, mm -hmm. right? Because those kids are in the same system that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, and they're struggling and so we're trying to figure that out. And and I, I think I heard a little murmur about some churches, the black <laughs> churches. I understand that as well too, but I will say not all, right? There are right. few. That they're tr they're trying. A few are trying. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely. The need mm -hmm. is great. Absolutely. Yeah, the need the need is is yeah. so great. The need is so great. And again, I always look at systems, I always look at the structure. What I have found with my black colleagues, black pastors, black churches um, in the Asheville region, they are scraping. Mm -hmm. Right? They're mm -hmm. surviving. And so they don't have the luxury to sit down and strategize and figure out how are we going to handle Kiki and them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or figure out a support system because they're trying to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. They're trying to deal with some, some real stuff that's happening inside of their congregations. Mm -hmm. I get that. So again, we got to look a little bit deeper. And, and not point to individuals necessarily, but we gotta keep our eye on the structure and figure out how we can dismantle, not using the master's tools, right? Mm -hmm. um, definitely using love and using truth telling, but we, gotta, we have to be more strategic and we have to do that collectively. So let me just say this. Mm -hmm. For clarity, I'm not actually pointing fingers at anyone, mm -hmm. but I have experienced personally having a son mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who was out there dealing drugs, mm -hmm. carrying guns, mm -hmm. and as a mother, mm -hmm. I stood, I took responsibility, and I said, not under my watch. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I advocated. I called the police. Mm -hmm. I had him arrested. Mm -hmm. I sat on his legs while the police put handcuffs on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I stood up in the courtroom and asked the judge to send him to juvenile detention center mm -hmm. since he wanted to commit crimes. Right. And so that right there stopped him in his tracks. And it stopped any of the drug dealers who were placing the drugs in his hands. Mm -hmm. It stopped them in their tracks. Absolutely. Now, I know everybody's not like me, because mm -hmm. you know, I just know they're not. Mm -hmm. And when I look back, you know, I, I think, wow, did I really do that? But I know it was by the grace of God Absolutely. and through his boldness. And so that's why I say that. Uh, you have people, I understand you have people living, you know, up in Oli Walker Heights who are afraid to stand up, they're afraid to say anything. Mm -hmm. The children can't go out and play on the playground, you know, so they have to keep them in the house. But I screamed. I jumped up and down. I screamed for help. I called the police. You know, I, I did everything that I needed to do because I knew I couldn't do it by myself. Yeah, yeah. And I'm grateful that you have a community of support, right? Mm -hmm. You have a church that supports mm -hmm. you. You have mm -hmm. people who are behind you. 
And that's why I think this relationship piece that we keep talking about is yeah. so important mm -hmm. because that empowers you. When you know you have a team mm -hmm. behind you, that's right. You can do a lot of things. That's right. Right. That's right. So I'm hoping that we will figure out how to build more of that, like these community connections. Yes. Um, and it, people may not look like you, right? That's but they're right. still part of the community. That's right. And they're going to support you um, and be there for you. So I appreciate. Your, your leadership and you standing up. And I know that was painful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have this thing with my children, like if you, if you go to jail and it's not for civil rights, don't call me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, because That's right. I, I need them to do better. They've been taught better, mm -hmm. right? And That's they need right. to walk into their purpose and that's not their purpose. That's so right. I, I certainly get that. Um, now, the other thing about this question um, about the opinion of the current viability of the housing development, I often wonder, like, viability for whom? Who are we asking about? And I can't really ask that because that person's online. Mm -hmm. But they um, also follow with um, the houses were built on these stolen properties and how the communities could be improved going forward. So people are wondering, now that all this has happened, mm -hmm. it's done. How can we help communities move forward, if you have any thoughts about that? And I guess forward, like bettering their lives, um, changing their circumstances. Like, how do, you, how do you view that? Well, some people in the community, and I've been sort of watching, and I've looked over some of the city plans, but some people believe that urban renewal is not over. Some community members believe that even in the South Side areas, you see the walking trails mm -hmm. being developed, you know, Walton Street Pool Park is, is being uh, redone as far as shrubbery and all of that. Some people are tending to believe that once again, even public housing residents would be uprooted and relocated out. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if that is true, I would like for truth to come out so that it would give those residents opportunity mm -hmm. um, for other choices instead of just all of a sudden you hear, okay, you have six months, you have a year, and you'll be relocated out way out in West Asheville or wherever. Mm -hmm. You know, you would give them opportunity to go purchase or find other living uh, quarters on their own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I guess uh, the next five, maybe 10 years, we'll see. Okay. Marshall. So we've got maybe time for one other question. Okay. I think Phyllis has one, and okay. then I have a few parting words after they answer. Okay. Excellent. This, is, uh, this may actually be something for our vice mayor. Your Honorable Vice Mayor Kilgore. Uh, and my question is, as related to the previous comment regarding public input. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I know that has happened in the past, uh, when people have sent emails for public input regarding the reparations process, it has not been mentioned. It hasn't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. So just any insight as to what people should do? Just keep sending the same comments, waiting, or hoping that at some point they'll, they'll be addressed or mentioned. But I just know that this is there's a current something going on, and I'm just, just trying to find a way to help people in the public who are trying to make uh, public their voice heard and make public input by sending an email, which is on the website, you put it, you send an email to public input, whatever it is, but it's not getting uh, crossed to uh, the commissioners uh, or mentioned during the reparations meeting. So any feedback would be helpful. Hmm. First of all, when you said it's not being reported, the only emails I, I, that I received are usually it's all addressed to council, so it goes to all of us on council. Mm -hmm. uh, we have received some emails about reparations, but more or less people are concerned as when and what are you doing. And unfortunately, until the committee 
is actually, because they're in charge right now, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that come back and give us suggestions and what they want, and so we don't want to get out ahead mm -hmm. of the commission, and so that's one reason we have not been. We just want, sort of want to give them the leeway to do whatever they need to do and come back with to us, and then we can work on it together. Mm -hmm. Does that help, Phyllis? So does the commission and, have and, their and like own I said, most of the people want to know what are you doing or them. when are we getting? But unfortunately, that's so why aren't they up forwarding to the those emails committee. to them? Yeah. So I, I really want to encourage Sorry. that question yeah. to come next Sunday night when we have the, the co-chairs of the Reparations Commission yeah. here as a part of our panel. And Mm -hmm. Ask some questions about the procedures and how those things are are, are happening. Tammy, mm -hmm. do you have anything else? Yeah, and I'm Priscilla, just anything wondering else before as, we as we're asking that question, um, and we will talk about it more next week. But when you send emails to the city, it does go to the city council, and you need it to go to the reparations commission. So we need to figure out how that happens. So let's ask that next week for sure. How do we directly communicate with all the IFAs or um, the co-chairs, and how does that information disseminate? How can you be sure that happens? So please save that question for next week. Um, yeah. Thank so you. So I, I want to appreciate um, GCPC for sitting with this, mm -hmm. right? And um, taking this in, and I know that your, your minds are turning, I know the spirit is turning, and so there's some discernment happening. But my hope is, um, and I'm sure it is yours in doing this Liberation City uh, series throughout the summer, that we are striving toward more mutual liberation. Like that's the goal of this. This is not just for our heads, no. right? This is to see how we can move forward in action as people of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, to recognize, uh, to realize real justice for black people in Asheville. So please continue to pray, discern, and figure out what your potential role can be because I think you're going to be asked to do some things fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very specific things. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you, St. James, Stella, do you for have being here. Anything else before? <laughs> no, thank you. So thank you most of all, <laughs> thank you yes. for your courage. You're like a lion. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so I do want us to take a moment just to share some gratitude with with claps, with hollers, with whatever you want to do. Stand up, but just some gratitude for Priscilla Robinson for her work in community. Yes. Please. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. I get God the glory. Yes, <laughs> yes. And and some gratitude for Reverend Tammy Forte Woo! Logan. <laughs> and just a reminder that part of this series is that these all of these events are on our YouTube channel now. They're there for you to share, for you to have. They are resources for the community, for the country, for whoever wants Absolutely. them. They're there. You just go to our GCPC um, YouTube channel, and it's right there, and you're welcome to share it and use it. Yes. Since next week is the commission chair specifically, yes. and a teeny tiny addition to what Libby was saying, we will just go ahead and offer child care yeah. here. So we will have three of our child care workers Sunday night, sometimes is a night that families can get out. Mm -hmm. So since the chairs will be here, we will just make sure we have child care. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, just quickly, okay. the Racial Justice Coalition has an effort initiative going on about reparations are due. Um, we have some information as you leave, just some about how to go to the website and support that effort. They're looking for 5,000 signatures. Mm. Hey, Thank you. And yes. when we have these conversations, that this word distraction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the reasons this process is so difficult mm -hmm. is because there are purposeful distractions right. that are put into place to keep us so divided mm -hmm. that we cannot focus together. Exactly. And so what often happens, whether it, it's, if it's about a black cause, then we bring up LGBTQIA, mm -hmm. and then the focus is, well, oh, which one of these are we? 
focused on, mm -hmm. if we could quiet the noise mm -hmm. and get rid of the distractions so that we can have a focused effort, mm -hmm. this process could be a lot clearer than what it is now. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that because in 2020, what I heard from young black folks is this. I heard two things. Number one, they said to older people like me, I ain't ancient, but I am a little bit older. <laughs> they said, what have y'all been doing? Mm. Why are we in this condition? And the second thing that they said was black church, where have you been? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so there's so much focus on homosexuality in the black church, this in the black church. The focus of all of us, black, white, green, or indifferent, should be on this effort because this is what repair looks like. And so I just want to make sure that when we're having these conversations, mm -hmm. we got to acknowledge the elephant in the room, and that elephant is called distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So and, and so, and this is where I want to wrap it back up to who GCPC is. Mm -hmm. We believe that our liberations are, are tangled up. Mm -hmm. There is no way to separate. Exactly. Nobody's free until we're all free. That's right. And so that's why we do have to come together as a community. Mm -hmm. And we are so grateful for this time with you. Thank you. you are a, a friend of this congregation, this Thank community. You. You're our sister. You're, you're a part of our community. Thank you. Appreciate that. And so we're here, and we, we want this conversation to continue. We hope you'll come back next week. And then in August, we're taking it, and we're looking at some national trends and the way that Asheville is, is getting distracted by all the stuff about critical race theory and all the things. Mm -hmm. And we have to stand strong as people of faith and just not let that That's stuff right. stop us. That's right. So um, gratitude for this evening. Gratitude for all of you, for all the folks online. And we look forward to just building deeper and deeper community so that this Asheville can be a model mm -hmm. for what true repair looks like yeah. for all people. Mm -hmm. For all people. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Blessing you so much. Wow. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just, it truly is amazing. You could teach a several week class. Oh, gracious. And I was actually thinking, how do we, how do we.